All right, we're live. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining our program today. My name is Eric White. I'm a member of the programming committee with the Bethel Dukes branch of Asala Association for the Study of Afro American Life and History. And uh, we are looking forward to a good program today. Uh, I want to introduce our panelists uh, first. Um, we have Demita Green, who is our webmaster, and um, she is also a consultant who does research in the area of history and genealogy. Her company is called uh, Yesteryear uh, Perspectives, and we want to thank her for her contribution in terms of helping to make our web programs uh, accessible. Um, I also want to introduce our uh, president, um, Ida B. Jones, uh, Ida Jones, uh, who is a archivist, who is the archivist at uh, Morgan State, and, uh, and as an author, she has several publications. Uh, she was our speaker for last month, and uh, if you didn't miss it, uh, we did record it, and we're looking to make some of these recordings available to you. Um, in the near future, we've had a good lineup of speakers and we wanna make sure people have access to that information. Our, uh, and last I'd like to introduce uh, LaVonda Broadneck, who is, um, who is a librarian at the Library of Congress. She's in the History, Humanities and Social Sciences Division. And uh, she's also a member of FREED, which is Female Reenactments of distinction uh, and the organization is connected with the uh, Afro-American Civil War Museum and they do reenactments uh, at a number of their different events and programs that take place. And uh, LaVonda is actually going to be introducing our guest speaker, uh, Marvin Jones, shortly. Um, without further ado, I'd like to have our president uh, bring some greetings. Uh, and uh, I did want to mention up front here, and I'll share my screen for a minute. Um, <clears throat> that uh, okay. Let's see. Just give me a second here. I have so many tabs open. Today's, uh, we will be having a program with uh, Marvin Jones, and many of you have gotten this flyer, and thank you for joining us today. Um, we, when you registered, we will be keeping your name and uh, sharing information about upcoming events that we will be hosting in 2020 and going into 2021. Our next speaker, for December will be Dr. Sekou Franklin, who's going to close us out with a discussion and a political analysis of the election and what's happening um, in Georgia and the impact that that uh, Senate race will have on the um, um, this new administration that's going in in 2021. And so, the registration forms for this will be going out very shortly, and we encourage you to join in this discussion, this very important, timely discussion. And without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Ida Jones, Dr. Jones, to bring welcome and to talk about the branch. And, uh, and Dr. Jones will also join us in the discussion with, with Marvin at the end of his presentation. Uh, along with uh, LaVonda. So Dr. Jones, take it away. Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Eric. Welcome back, Marvin Jones, cousin from another mother. I want to thank him for his um, broad appeal. He has spoken to our group before when we were in place at the Woodridge branch of the DC Public Library, which is our in-person gathering space where Mr. White works as a librarian. 
So in light of the pivot we've all had to do with the coronavirus, we have gone to a virtual platform and I'm thankful to both uh, Eric White and Demita Green for taking up the technology and moving our branch into this virtual space. So I wanna bring greetings on behalf of the national uh, body of the Association for the Study of African-American Life and History, the oldest continuous organization of land professional historians chronicling and documenting and sharing information about the Africana experience founded by Dr. Carter G. Woodson in 1915. In Woodson's vision, he saw the idea of melding the town and the gown together in a seamless conversation about the African-American life. So there are branches around the country. And in Washington, D.C., there are three branches of which the Bethel Dukes branch is among the second oldest. And Bethel Dukes was a person. He was our founding namesake. We were formerly the far northeast, southeast branch. But uh, on the passing of Mr. Dukes, the branch thought it not robbery to name the branch in his honor because Mr. Dukes, his wife, and several other couples actually used to meet in their house and have meetings in the 1970s. We're a 45-year-old plus branch, and we're continuing to grow and expand ourselves into the high schools and elementary schools, as well as those of a mature level. So we welcome everybody to participate with us. And as Eric did state, this is being recorded. This recording will be shared via the Facebook page, as well as possibly remaining in the cloud, and we'll share the link. And finally, we would also like to welcome those who have children, young adults, educators, to share with their young people through these virtual platforms, which I know are a bit tiresome now in this age of corona. But nevertheless, information is always available. We like to share sound information generated by our people and filtered by our people. So once again, we will be contacting you. You will not be um, on any kind of third party email spam list, but there will be a disclaimer thanking you for coming and also letting you know that we will email you at least quarterly, if not monthly about our programming. So thank you so much, Marvin Jones. Thank you so much, Demita and Eric, as well as Ms. Broadnecks um, for all of what you're doing and just sit back and relax and enjoy. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones. Uh, <clears throat> I wanna put out a little acknowledgement to uh, uh, my wife, Linda White, uh, who helped us expand our, our registration today. Uh, you know, we capped off at 100 people. And in order to let additional people in, there was an additional fee that had to be paid. So, you know, she helped sponsor that. And so thank you, Linda. And um, without further ado, I'm going to let Lavonda introduce our guest speaker for today. And Let's get right on into our program. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. It is my pleasure today to introduce our guest speaker. My introduction, however, is going to start with just a little geography lesson. The Winton Triangle is one of the oldest communities of land owning people of color in America. The Winton Triangle is in the Hepford County and that's in the Northeast part of North Carolina. The original inhabitants were the Chawanki people. The first landowners of color arrived way back in 1740 mostly from the Chesapeake Bay area. As they lived there, they developed long-standing community and family ties. Many of these early people were literate and they were multi-skilled. By the time of the Civil War, they had lived there for over a hundred years, but they were still impacted by racial restrictions on many of their rights and this included their voting rights. It has been discovered that there were some six, some 80 men from the Winton Triangle who joined the US colored troops or served as soldiers or served as sailors in the Civil War. Our speaker today, Mr. Marvin Tupper Jones is a native of the Coalfield Village in the Winton Triangle. And that village is comprised of that triangle. Okay, Mr. Marvin Tupper Jones is a native of the Coalfield Village. And there are three villages in the area that comprise the Winton Triangle. 
He began his commitment to the community more than a decade ago by scanning photographs of his relatives and neighbors. The Winton Triangle Digital Collection today has over 7,000 photographs, documents, maps, audio and visual recordings. Mr. Jones is the owner of the Marvin T. Jones Associates, and which is a professional photography company in Washington, DC. He's also the executive director of the Chawan Discovery Group. The mission of the Chawan Discovery Group is to research, document, preserve, and present the history of the land-owning, tri-racial, people of color of the Winton Triangle. In addition to his numerous presentations and numerous articles, his accomplishments include scripting a play, writing a book, five documentaries, and at least eight highway historical markers. An award from the North Carolina Society of Historians and an award from the African American Historical and Genealogy Society. Those 80 US colored troops and sailors that I mentioned earlier, they fit right in with the Asala theme this year, African Americans and the vote. You see those men and their service helped to restore the voting rights that had been taken in 1835. And two of those soldiers were in the North Carolina House of Representatives. These rights that the servicemen restored allowed many people, including Mr. Jones's father, to vote even during Jim Crow. I now present to you Mr. Marvin Tupper Jones, his topic today, the Winton Triangles families of the U.S. colored troops. Mr. Jones. Good afternoon. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, thank you to the panel. Thank you, Lavanda, Eric, uh, Demita, and my friend and my friend Ida. Also, thank you. Eric's a good friend, and his wife Linda's a good friend. Linda, thank you for expanding the amount of people that can attend today. Also, want to thank the supporters of Chawan Discovery Group. We are a five hundred one c three nonprofit, and um, that support really means a lot. And the expenses and the mission of the Chawan Discovery Group. I'm going to share my screen. And get started. Ah, okay. And um, to why discover my work really began. You could say my work began in in the seventies when I began photographing, documenting our loggers, our logging companies in the Winton Triangle. And then when my church turned uh, 150 years old, I scanned, start, began scanning a lot of photographs of, of church members. And I realized we, how rich our history was. So this led into the formation of Chawan Discovery in 2009, and we are 501c3. And um, our launch our public launch was in 2009 when we had a stage production uh, telling the triangle's history it was at the Ahosky, Hoskins community theater uh, the gallery the gallery theater in 2009 and we had about 40 people on stage uh, for a 70 minute stage production uh, we had the Meharan Chowano Indians, two choirs, and high school students doing skits, enfolded in a lecture very much like this one. We, for research, we use archives, family collections, books, internet uh, searches. We go to cemeteries, farms, 
We go into the woods for some of these cemeteries, fee-based sources like Ancestry, and we do interviews. Um, my friend Earl Imes, who is a curator at the North Carolina History Museum, suggested that I apply for, I nominate some of our history through North Carolina highway markers. And so our first highway marker was for the Choanoke people or Choanoke people in 2011. You see here pictured me in the corner with, uh, with Choanoke descendants, most, almost all of whom are my family. And we've had other markers to go up as well. Uh, we have seven up right now. One is waiting, the pandemic and, 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 and other shortfalls are holding one back and that is for Wiles Raid next year uh, that will go up in Elizabeth City. Recently, a Civil War trails marker was replaced and in upgrading it, uh, they added a sidebar about one of our soldiers, Martin Reynolds. So it's the first time in my county, a USCT has been publicly recognized, uh, well, publicly recognized. And oh, by the way, Martin Reynolds lives on, uh, is buried on our farm. Uh, we use news articles, we write articles to help support some of these markers and our other work. This is an article I wrote about Robert Lee Van, who, who was the publisher of the Pittsburgh Courier, which was in 1935 the largest African-American newspaper with a circulation of 250,000. Oh, by the way, you see him in this picture with Bill Bojangles Robinson, Shirley Temple, and Robert Van. Isn't that something? And, and the Van marker is in a husky, and this is Van's portrait. We also have placed one of our schools, the Pleasant Plains Schoolhouse, on the National Register of Historic Places. And that school existed as early as 1859. This is, of course, two years before the Civil War. Uh, Chawan Discovery also supports researchers and authors. I uh, use some of the books where, where we provided research, where we have supported the authors. We also give tools to history professionals from Duke University, North Carolina a and North Carolina Central University to graduate students, Fayetteville State University, Brevard College, State Preservation, East Carolina University, and the Roanoke Chihuahua Center. And we won awards, as LaVonda said earlier, from the North Carolina Society of Historians and the Afro African American History and Genealogical Society in, our, in uh, just a couple of years ago. So that's one idea of the work that Chihuahua Discovery does. And we'll still, I was working, I was doing some wine discovery work yesterday and today. Now we go into my presentation about the families of USCT, Winton Triangles, Men Color, and Civil War. Usually when you hear of USCT stories, you might hear of one soldier or one regiment. Here we're talking about families who had four or more members in the United States Hollow Troops. And the Winton Triangle story, before I tell that, I want to tell the Winton Triangle, at least give a little more background to Winton Triangle. Our history begins in 1584 when English first came to North Carolina with the intent of colonization. And they heard about the Chowan Oaks. Uh, you see this map of North Carolina. Here is here is Chesapeake, Virginia, Norfolk right about here. Roanoke Island and the Outer Banks is here. The Albemarle Sound, you have two rivers, the Roanoke River and the Chowan River. This inset in Albemarle Sound goes up to Chowan and you see the capital of Chowanoke. And I should mention I'm a Chowanoke descendant. Uh, Hereford County, our county, is in the northeastern corner of North Carolina. And this close up of Hertford County shows us Chowan River. Uh, and the shaded area is how I estimated our land ownership in the 1960s. I call it the Winton Triangle, our community, because it the land ownership traverses the towns of Winton, Coalfield, and Ahoskie. 
historically, uh, one of our communities, Pleasant Plains, was a community of landowning mixed race people. That means that they are Native American, African, uh, European. Uh, I even have it, uh, uh, East Indian ancestry from 1790. A lot of us are descended from East Indians who came to the Chesapeake Bay in 1790, among other ancestors. Two of the first landowners in Winton Triangle were William Weaver and Thomas Archer, who were connected. And they both came out of the Chesapeake Bay area. William Weaver's father was from India. And they bought land on creeks in Hertford County. And those creeks just happened to be the geographic extent, east and west, of the Winton Triangle. Other families came in as well, mostly from Virginia, such as the Manless Halls and Nickenses and others. Their sons served in the War of Independence in the American Revolution. And the community began to go, grow. Other families came in. Another significant point after the American Revolution was the Nat Turner Rebellion on August 21st in 1831. Most times when I'm driving between the Winston Triangle and D.C., I pass the Nat Turner uh, the highway marker in Virginia for Nat Turner, and it's and the rebellion happened in our native uh, happened in our neighboring county of Southampton County. The oldest family document, my family's oldest document, is this here, and it is the freedom document of Nor Robbins, who was born free. He was a Chowanoke. And when I first saw it, I was wondering why he had it, because I knew he was a free person and not enslaved. But when I looked at the date, I realized why. Now, here's the text from the marker, I mean, from the certificate. Nor Robbins, a man of color, have made application to this court to grant him a certificate certifying that he is a free man and a native of this county and in proofs being rendered to that effect it was then and there ordered that the clerk of said court should give said nor to said nor robbins a certificate certifying that he is a free man of color and a native of said county is entitled to all the rights and privileges of free men of color given under my hand and seal of office the 25th day of august anno domini 1831. now this is four days after the nat turner rebellion this nor was supposed to have this all along. He ignored the North Carolina law, but after the rebellion broke out, uh, whites went crazy. They were looking for retribution. They were panicking. And he realized that if he didn't have this document, anything could happen to him. He needed proof that he was Nor Robbins. He needed proof that he was a native of Gates County, which was Hertford County and, North ha and Southampton County. As LaVonda said earlier, free men of color lost the right to vote in North Carolina in 1835. It would take over 30 years and a war to restore that right to men of color. The Winton Triangle, the Pleasant Plains community of the Winton Triangle wanted a church around the time of Nat Turner, but the backlash to the rebellion held up that. But around 1850, things quieted down, um, and the powers that be were willing for Pleasant Plains to have a church. You had Sally Jones Weaver, her husband Willis Weaver, both of whom are ancestral aunts and uncles who married each other, aunt and uncle who married each other. Sally Jones, Jones's brother Wiley, uh, as well, and his wife Mary were, were pre law war leaders at the Pleasant Plains community. I'm also related to Mary Jones as well. All, the, all four of my our relatives. So, around 1850, the community made a contract with Willis Weaver's brother Lawrence to build a church. And you had leaders in the church to, to sign or give their marks for this contract. And in 1851, Pleasant Plains gets its first church. And this is the first institution 
of the Wenton Triangle. In the beginning of the Civil War in Wenton Triangle, it starts pretty much locally when Martha Keene, a member of Pleasant Plains Church founded Jesse Keene, you see his mark here with his, signet, with his name, he was, she was used as a lure to on February 19th, 1862. And, and this is something I grew up with. All of us grew up knowing this. What we didn't, we always were told this was a bad day in Hertford County. Well, actually, if you're a person of color, it tended to be a good day. Whenever Union guns showed up, that was your chance to be free. Well, Martha King found herself caught between two sets of guns, but the Union commander saw the Confederate guns hidden, hidden in, in the palisade above, turned around, and was fired upon. Martha King was not caught between two sets of cannons that day. One thing historians never look at is Martha King's background. Uh, it's just said that the Confederates paid her money to be on the war, wave a cloth to lure the boat in. The truth is she was a 35-year-old married woman with three children nine, and nine years old and younger. She was really forced. She and her husband, she was forced to be on the war whether she was paid or not. Her husband was forced to see this happen. Um, she did live to she did live to be 90 years old. Uh, she died during World War One. But the amazing thing was, seven years after that awful day, her daughter is a student at Hampton University. And this is uh, one of the Union gumball, gum, uh, cannonballs from the shelling of Winton in 1862. Another story we have is that Wiley Jones was climbing, was up on a tree celebrating the burning of Winton. So we have an alternative here. Uh, in 1847, going back a little bit, Winton, there's, there, there are records of Winton Triangle men receiving licenses to own firearms. firearms. I mean, these men had farms, they had forests. Uh, they should own fi firearms so they can hunt and protect their their poultry and livestock. Um, in response to the war, a lot of Winston Triangle men enlisted in the Union military. Whenever the Union gun, gunboats took over the Chihuahua River, and whenever a gunboat showed up, that was when people could escape. You had white escaping, you had all kinds of people escaping, and you had all kinds of men who were just walking two miles or three miles or however, or either the soldiers from the gunboats come to your community like Pleasant Plains, and you could just go away and join the military. This is a selected list of soldiers from the same families in the same regiment, such as if you can follow the cursor, you have two Collins brothers, two Lewis brothers, two Manly brothers, all these Reynolds, two Scott brothers. Uh, Edward Sears had a brother in another regiment and all these weavers, a lot of weavers, all uh, descended from that William Weaver who bought land in the 1740s. Uh, Martha Keene's brother-in-law, Joshua Keene, was a weaver cousin and he was also in this regiment. And then we go to Weaver family soldiers, the same regiment, uh, uh, heavy artillery, United States colored. You have Samuel Walden who married into the Weaver family and all these Weavers that are listed. And they served in the 14th as garrison soldiers and laborers in New Bern and in Beaufort, North Carolina. Uh, one, of the so one of the soldiers who was a Sergeant, Enoch Luton, and some of his descendants are online today uh, I want to acknowledge them. Uh, he wrote a letter to Nancy Weaver Walden. And it follows, and you see his signature uh, uh, with his photograph. The letter goes, Dear Madam, I now seat myself as to let you know that I am in common health. And all the boys that are living, Richard R. Weaver are dead and your husband Samuel Walden also. He lived about a month after he got to the regiment. He died with the with typhoid dysentery. He requested that I write to you. 
Here you see the photograph of Nessa Weaver Walden. She was the daughter of Sally Jones Weaver and Willis Weaver. It took her 57 years to get a pension. She had children with Samuel Weaver. And it's in 1922 when she finally got her pension payment. It was all in one lump sum. She was overwhelmed by the amount and she had a heart attack and died. And she's not buried, she's buried not far from here with her parents and her second husband. Another family moving on, a Reynolds family in the 14th Heavy Infantry United States Colored. All these Reynolds as you see here. Again, there were garrisons Burn and Beaufort. One of the Reynolds is Thomas Reynolds escaped from the Confederacy. In his pension record, his his um, Conrad writes, I was with him when 29 of us run away from Hertford County NC to get to the Union lines. It was in February 1864, and we were about three weeks getting to Plymouth, North Carolina, about 60 miles from Hertford County. I remember we came on a boat called a bombshell from Catherine Creek on the Chilwan River. Matthew Walden, who was probably a cousin of Samuel Walden, um, I'm sitting right now four out, four miles from Catherine Creek. It's now, the town is now, the area is now called Tunis. My wife and I walked there many times. I used to bike there when I would take a break working at our father's store in Coalfield. The Bazell Collins family of soldiers included John Bazell, a founder of Pleasant Place Church. You see his mark along with his name. And he was the uncle of the Collins brothers. And John Bazell enlisted in the 14th Heavy, along with his nephews, John and Simon. An older brother, Tom Collins, served in the otherwise all-white 188 Pennsylvania Infantry. There were men of color who were assigned to these white regiments. Thomas Collins was wounded at Cole Harbor, Virginia, in June of 1864. He was a brick mason, a teacher, and, a, and the first pass of color at Pleasant Plains. I explained that in saying that Pleasant Plains was allowed to be formed, but it could not have in 1851 and until the, after the war a pass of color. Also, the white deacons of a, of a nearby church oversaw what was going on at the church. Uh, Pleasant Plains was not also, enslaved people could not attend Pleasant Plains. Enslaved people had to attend the churches, churches of their enslavers. John Collins, one of the nephews, um, served in testified for veterans who applied for pensions. And so did his brother, Simon. Let me move back. Um, he also, Simon Collins was head of the, of the Winton chapter of the Grand Army of the Republic, and that was a Union Veterans Association. He, he was a teacher, a brick mason like his brother Thomas, and he too, like John, testified for veterans who applied for pensions. Uh, and here's a letter that, Tom, that Simon Collins wrote to an educational and business leader, William D. Newsom, who was also a member of Pleasant Plains. In this letter, he is detailing students in Harrellsville, which is near the site of Chilwanoak, and he's reporting how many students he has and so forth. And at, looking at the date, I believe my great-great-grandmother was a student at that time at that school. Here we have a list of Winton Triangle soldiers, a partial list of Winton Triangle soldiers in the 2nd Cavalry, uh, United States Colored Troops. Um, you have Levi Brown, Martin Van Buren Reynolds, who I'll talk about, the Robinses. You have Edwin Sears' brother, Belva, I mentioned him earlier. Uh, James Walden, who is Samuel Walden's, Samuel Walden's brother. The 2nd Cavalry fought in Suffolk, they fought their way to Petersburg and Richmond, and they were to siege of Richmond to the war's end. 
they served in Texas around the time of Juneteenth on the Mexican border, and the purpose was to counter the French invasion of Mexico. In the Robbins family, one of the soldiers was John Robbins in the 2nd Cavalry. He enlisted in January of 1864, and during his first battle in April of 1864, the side of his head was slashed by a saber in hand-to-hand -hand fighting when he fell off his horse. And several months passed before he received medical treatment. Along with his cousins, he was also sent to Texas. He eventually lost sight in that eye. In his pension folder, his letter he wrote to the commission in August of 1889. I will mention day of skirmish, the ninth day of April 1864. It was the total loss of my right eye to a saber wound inflicted by the enemy in this skirmish in Suffolk, Virginia, which is only 40 miles of where I am right now. No U.S. Army surgeon or assistant was present for three or four months after the fight. I wounded the heel flesh myself in three or four weeks. The broken bone was very painful and not healed for a great length of time. My right eye almost failed. It has been 10 years since I failed a whole office on account of my failure of eyesight. His officer, one of his officers, Robert Dollard, who later became the first Attorney General of South Dakota, wrote the next year, John H. Robbins was wounded. He remembers distinctly the remarkable escape from death of Sid Robbins in the struggle where he was wounded, that he was struck on the head by his assailant in a hand-to-hand -hand conflict in which we were all engaged with a saber. And it was at that time regard us, regarded as miraculous that he was not instantly killed thereby. I am glad to support your claim for a pension with my affidavit of the facts connected with the remarkable struggle of your personal encounter at Suffolk. It is proper that I should be able on this day to pay some slight tribute to a member six years ago today at Jones Bridge on the Chickahominy River did itself in the race to which its right belonged, a credit that ought to be imperishable in history. Although injustice has denied such a place, Robert Dollard. To understand what it took to defeat slavery, I occasionally like to show these photographs of the cities that were destroyed. To defeat slavery, Richmond had to look like this, even though the Conf Confederates destroyed, burned Richmond before they abandoned it to the Union forces. Also serving in the second is Parker David Robbins. He was a Sergeant Major in the second. He was from the Chowanoke mixed race community in Gates County, just like John Robbins. Again, he was fought in Suffolk, and he was in, in Mexico as well. He also married into a Collins family when he, when he and Elizabeth Collins married in 1858. So he, Thomas, John, and Simon Collins are his brothers-in-law. After the war, Parker was a state legislator, a postmaster, a holder of two patents. He was a sawmill owner, a house built, steamship builder, and owner. And there's a highway marker dedicated to Parker David Robbins. Um, on Friday, my wife Carol and I went to his town where he moved in Magnolia, North Carolina, and Duplin, and we visited his grave and we visited the marker. We like to go on drives occasionally during the pandemic. So we visited um, Parker Robbins on Friday. And we also discovered that he had a, an adopted daughter who died at five years old while we were there. Um, and being a state legislator, that was something that just could not happen before the war for a person of color. Just like Martha King's daughter could not have gone to an institute of higher learning 
after the war. That was something that Martha King could conceive. It might not have been to be a legislator was not something Parker himself could have conceived um, during the war and most of, and, 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 and in his life up to that time. And so William David Newsom, who I mentioned earlier, had a list of voters. Um, there's a private collector who let me go through a lot of papers and, and I found this list of voters from 1867. And here's some of the soldiers on that list. John Bazell, who I mentioned earlier, Levi Brown, uh, William, William Keene, uh, Elvis Lewis, Charles Lewis, I mentioned them earlier, Benjamin Morris, who was a sailor, my great-great-grandfather, Andrew Jackson Reynolds, who's buried on this farm. Um, well, no, his brother Martin is buried on this farm. Um, Elvis Sears, who I mentioned earlier, James Walden, whose farm is next door to ours, and two of the Weavers. They voted in 1867. And a lot of this, even though after Reconstruction, a lot of votes, voting was, was, was suppressed again, it rose again a century later. And Nora Robbins' great granddaughter became an election judge and that was an election judge. We see her with her certificate appointing her as a judge and this is her pay stub. I have these documents because Mrs. Pearlene C. Jones is my mother. And I'm proud to, and she was proud of this. She was, she, uh, this is one of the few times she got a paycheck, a proper paycheck with a stub and with uh, social security taken out and, 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 it, and it, she had some, some authority. Otherwise her authority was on the farm at my father's store and as a deaconess at Pleasant Plains Church and her children, of course, she was our authority as mothers are. Parker went to the House of Representatives in 1868. He was elected in 1867. And this is one of his letters in August of 1868 to, to Elizabeth Collins Robbins. My dear wife, don't fail to send to Winton after me on Wednesday, the 19th of August. With the help of the Lord, I will come to you and let it rejoice your heart to think that your husband will take supper with you Wednesday night, and I will never leave you again. But where you go, you will go with me, your affectionate husband, Parker D. Robbins. A second letter to send the family is December 1st, 1869. Not quite so affectionate. Kill my pork on Monday, the 15th. Keep the hogs on a close pen about six days before you kill them. Please inform me if you received a long leather bound book, the public laws. If so, let me know. If not, tell Jackson to inquire at the office, if so, to keep it. Your affectionate husband, Parker D. Robbins. I believe Jackson is my great grandfather, Andrew J Jackson Robbins, who served in the 14th, in the 34th Infantry, and I'll talk to you about him. And I'm talking to you on Andrew Jackson's farm right now. Parker also received two patents, one for a cotton cultivator, and here you see his patent for a sharpening machine. And he received that in 1877. And this was just when he, when Reconstruction ended. When North Carolina wants to feature, historians talk about the Civil War, they always, Parker Robbins is like the poster child or poster man for USCTs uh, because he seems to be the only one where there's image of a USCT in uniform. Um, also in the audience, I hope today is Rodney Barfield, who was curator of the North Carolina History Museum. He mounted an exhibit called the Black Presence in North Carolina. It was probably the first time such an exhibit was given by a museum. It was 1978, or 1978, I believe I first heard about it. And he also wrote an article about Parker, David Robbins. Um, with the information Rodney Barfield supplied in my, and a little bit of my research, 
I nominated him for a marker. A few months after the Children Oak marker, we had a dedication of the Children Oak marker. We had a dedication of, of marker in Parkerstown of Magnolia. We had reenactors to come in from Wilmington. And the funny thing is, you see here, Sergeant Fred Johnson, who's since left us, he called me the next day and said, oh, we have some Confederate women who also like to attend our events and we'd like to know if they can come. These are Confederate women in mourning. And I said, boy, this is weird. This is the 21st century. I said, yes, yes, Sergeant Fred, please let them come. Uh, one amazing thing is I later, he told me the day after that, that this lady here is a Robin's ascendant. And she showed me a photograph that day of her great grandmother who clearly looked Indian. And I later learned that Robinson's had moved to Wilmington and, and, and their general disper and their general dispersals. And also here's Parker's grave in Magnolia, about a half a mile from the marker. You see me with my cousin Erica, Linnell, and Jewel. Uh, we have Stacy Blunt from Fayetteville State University. And we have the mayor of Magnolia who put all this land so the grave will look great. On Friday, it's all overgrown again, but it's still easy to get to. Also for the dedication, the, uh, the school system had 92 students to make drawings about Parker's life. After all, there were so many things. And, they were, and I was loaned all these drawings so I could photograph them. And my cousin Paula, uh, my cousin Robert's descendant, Paula Sandelman, donated money for awards uh, to some of these students. And she and her husband and I were the judges of, of these drawings. Parker's brother, Augustus, was also pretty distinguished. Uh, you saw a photograph of me and his and, and members of his church at his grave in Windsor, North Carolina. He was a quartermaster sergeant. His brother was sergeant major. and was in the same regiment. Uh, he had the same experiences as Parker. But after the war, about 10 years after Parker, he served in the North Carolina state legislator. He was a store owner, a carpenter, and postmaster. He founded the church where he's buried. And he also was a founder of the first high school for people of color in Bertie County, which is south of us. His son became one of the first physicians of color. And then we come to two more Robinses. We come to my great grandfather, Andrew Jackson Robbins, who was a who became a corporal in the 3rd or 4th Infantry. He enlisted in Jacksonville. Um, in April of 1864, he was on Morris Island at the mouth of Charleston, Charleston's Harbor. And he and, he and his brother, older brother Noah, Noah Jr., Noah Robbins Jr., labored on forts that destroyed Charleston. They both fought in the Battle of Honey Hill in South Carolina, which is south of Charleston. After the war, he became a prosperous farmer with many of 15 children. His youngest three children graduated from college. One was a physician, and his first son was named after Parker David Robbins. And that first son is my grandfather. That's the first Parker David Robbins I knew about, is my grandfather. And I was born in my grandfather's house, which is next door to this house. It's the house that my parents built that I'm sitting in. This is Jack Robbins's, we, he's known as Jack. Jack Robbins' promotion paper, the corporal towards the end of his service. And that's an, among our family papers. Now to give you an idea of the relation, whenever I give, well, whenever I give a talk about the Winton Triangle soldiers, I used to use this flyer before. Uh, this very striking picture of Jack Robbins, this very stern looking picture, intimidating looking picture. But consider all the relations that Jack Robbins had in his life. He's the father of 15. He's the husband of three wives. He buried two. Uh, my great grandmother was the first wife that, that, that he buried. Um, he was a farmer. He was a deacon. He was son-in-law of a sailor. He was brother-in-law of soldiers. Uh, two soldiers. He was a cousin of soldiers. Four, he, had, he had three cousins that were soldiers, and he was the brother of a soldier and a soldier himself. And among his relations, his neighbors was his 
were his brother-in-law, Andrew Jackson Reynolds. And he was, uh, Andrew Jackson Reynolds was a president of the Grand Army of Republic chapter in Winton. His other neighbor was James Walden, Samuel Walden's brother. And, he, and James Walden was also president of the local chapter. So all these soldiers were interconnected in the Winton Triangle. They're testifying for each other, such as the Collins brothers, John and Simon. They're testifying for Jack Robbins. You see Simon Collins' name here. Um, you see John Collins' name here. Uh, after Jack died, James Walden testified for Jack's widow. Um, and then you have the last ones, Noah Robbins Jr. Uh, who worked on those forts. He served with his, with his younger brother. Uh, he had all these Robbins cousins. And this is a provost marshal pass that he had in 1863. Now, Harry Jones, who was the curator of the African-American Civil War Museum, told me that to have a pass from the provost marshal, this pass allows him to pass the, the pass to Suffolk, and of course, within six months, Noah has joined, the, he and his brother have, have joined the, uh, uh, the 34th Infantry. To have a pass from the Provost Art Marshal probably means that you were supplying some pretty good intelligence against the Confederacy, that the Robinsons were spying. Another indication of that could be that, that Parker and Augustus were made sergeants within eight days of enlisting as well. From Noah Robbins' Jr.'s pension application, we have this. He contracted measles, resulting in disease in the lungs and consequent of the exposure and hardships then and there. Work on fortifications then in the following manner. The troops had built a battery. His injury came from overstraining himself while it worked on fortifications. Excuse me for a minute. And this is a result of the work on those fortifications. Charleston was destroyed. And that's what it took to destroy slavery in America the destruction of Atlanta, Charleston, Richmond, the burning of Winton, uh, even a town of Harrellsville was burned, not to the extent of Winton, but it took that kind of destruction to defeat slavery. Now here, going back, we have three USCTs that have three adjacent farms. You have Jack Robbins, the farm on right now, we have next door to this farm, Martin Van Buren Reynolds of the 2nd Cavalry. Uh, he served with, he served with uh, Park and Augustus and John. Um, and Martin bought a car, you know, the farm two miles from Coalfield. And then next to Martin Van Buren Reynolds's grave is James Walden, who was in the same regiment as Martin Van Buren and Park and Augustus. I passed this grave. Um, I passed this grade thousands of times. I passed it several times yesterday. And um, again, my, my father bought this farm from Reynolds' son. And then James Walden, who is married into the Weaver family, who's a neighbor <coughs> of these soldiers. Um, he served with Parker, Augustus, and John. His brother Samuel was in the 14th. And like Samuel married into the Weaver family, <coughs> co-founded two schools, including the one that my mother attended. My mother and, and the rest of us attended both of them. My father attended the high school. <coughs> Excuse me, I'll take a little walk. As I mentioned earlier, he was the president of the Grand Army Republic chapter in Winton. For seven years, one of James Walden's daughters was reared and educated by John T. Reynolds, who later served in the legislature, and his wife, Lydia Ward Reynolds. <laughs> Both were Freeman's borough teachers. 
And again, he married into the Weaver family. Most of the Weaver, uh, the Walden daughters attended Shaw University. <coughs> and James Walden became treasurer of Pleasant Plains Church, the wealthiest and most influential of churches. And he founded two schools. I wish I had a photograph of the Walden School, but it burned early, um, about 30 years ago. <clears throat> but two of its students, John and Henry Combo, made a model of it. And the Combos live about a half a mile from us, and they live even closer. Uh, their ancestor was James Walden's partner in founding the school. Walden bought, was a founder also of a high school that my parents and my siblings and I attended in Winton. It is known on C.S. Brown School, but it started out as Chilwan Academy. Uh, he bought voting stock for this nonprofit venture, and he has share. He has share number five. And hundreds of descendants of Winton Trump soldiers attended and taught at water at Chuan Academy, which became Waters Normal Institute. It is now C.S. Brown STEM High School in Winton. John Collins worked there and <clears throat> his son graduated from the school and came to Washington, went to Howard University of Law and founded a law, uh, a law school, the Freeling Housing School of Law in Washington, D.C. His partner in the founding of that was Anna Julia Cooper. And our last slide is of the centennial of that high school in, 18, in 1986. My brother and sister and I decided we would come home that weekend for this special occasion. It was and on Sunday at our last event, one of the speakers was Miss Alice Nickens. Here you see here at the podium. She was she was our, our, our teacher. Um, um, you see behind her, uh, Robert Ash, who is the pastor of Pleasant Plains, my cousin John Pierce, and so many others. Well, Miss, who is Miss Alice besides a school teacher? And a C.S. Brown alumnus and uh, alumni. She is Wiley and Mary Jones's granddaughter. She's James and Millie Walden's granddaughter. And she's Sally Jones Wheeler and Willis Wheeler's great granddaughter. One thing that not only are we multi skilled people, we pass on what our parents and grandparents and so on gave us and we built upon their shoulders. And Miss Alice is an example of that. Uh, despite Jim Crow, we used our skills and our relationships to constantly build and constantly look out for ourselves and for each other. Uh, there are so many lessons to learn from the Winton Triangle, and we learned so much from our soldiers, and we built so much on the shoulders of our USDTs and others. And I want to thank you for having me to talk, and I look forward to your comments. Thank you again. Good afternoon, Marvin. Thank you so much for a very incomprehensive and enlightening discussion on the triracial area of Winston, Winton, North Carolina. There have been several posted questions in the chat, and I think I'll just go there. Uh, one attendee was interested in the cultural exclusion practiced within the community church, Pleasant Plains. African Americans of a hue of a certain hue were unable able to be included in the church until the 1970s. Can you address any elements of that? Oh, that's a good question. First, we start out in that Pleasant Plains was not allowed to have slaves in 1851. Enslaved people had attended churches of their owners. 
also enslaved people did not leave and live in the area of Pleasant Plains Church because all the land around it was owned by mixed race people, landowners. And even after the war, enslaved people were more like freed people were more likely to go to new churches that were founded after the war. And you do have in the Winton Triangle community against darker people. Um, you see it in other areas. Um, you see it even today, not only in the Winton Triangle, you see it in Washington, D.C., you see it in other cities. Um, it is something we all struggle with. It is something that we all, that's been passed down from the powers that be. Um, I even see people who are dark skinned discriminated against dark skinned folks, um, men who won't date women who are their skin color or even a little lighter and so forth. Um, and it's been a, it's been a bit of a hardship for everybody it, it, and it will continue. So I'm afraid, uh, unless, unless power is built when you have power, it's hard to discriminate against you, regardless of whether it's colorism, racism. And that is the strongest thing I can say to overcome colorism. There's a question from Dr. Margaret Bernice Smith Bristow, who's the historian of the Hampton Roads branch of ASALA. She said such an informative presentation in view of the fact that her mother was from Mapleton, real close to Murphy Murfreesboro. Yes, yes. Her question is, do you think the Weaver Orphanage in Hampton, Virginia was related to some of the Weavers you mentioned in the among the USCT at one time, uh, who was seeking information on the Weaver lineage? So she's asking a genealogical question. Good. I got the answer for that. <laughs> William B. Weaver and his wife, I believe her name was Anna, of the Weaver Orphanage. Uh, William B. Weaver was the son of Willis Weaver and Sal Jones Weaver. He attended Pleasant Plains School, and then he and his brothers and his sister attended Hampton. Um, his wife, Anna Weaver, was Frederick Douglass's granddaughter. And before the orphanage, William B. Weaver and another man founded the Gloucester Training School in Gloucester, Virginia. That's excellent. Thank you for sharing. Uh, oh, by the way, William B. Weaver also attended Hampton with Book D. Washington. Oh, OK. Excellent. Uh, one question was, can you explain why it was important for Noah Robbins to get the letter saying he was free? This is during the Nat Turner uprising. You talked about it very briefly, but if you can explain more so what that meant in terms of his life and death in the wake of the uh, uprising of Nat Turner. Think of the persecutions that, <clears throat> that Arabs and Sikhs endured immediately after 9-11 in 2001. Think of that. You can compare it to that. Think of, um, I remember there was a Ethiopian who was wearing a, a, a t-shirt with Haile Selassie on it and he almost got in trouble because they thought he was celebrating Osama bin Laden. And so Noah Robbins needed to have a document that proved that he was a free person and that he lived where he lived. Otherwise, he could have, it, it would have been easy to kidnap him, it would have been easy to kill him. It would have been, I mean, his community would insulate him some. But it was also required by a lot of people of color to have that document if adults. That's, that's excellent. Thank you for sharing that. There was a question from Michael Davenport about what role the archers in Archer Town play in the military during this period. I found one archer who was a soldier, and he died of illness while serving in the 14th Heavy. 
That's, and I'd have to look up his name. Gotcha. Um, another question from uh, Cheryl Gooch. Where did the Winton Triangle area USCT enlist? Uh, many of them caught gumboat that took them to Plymouth, North Carolina. A few went, were taken to Roanoke Island. Um, and then they were inducted in New Bern, especially if they were in the 14th Heavy. Those that were in the 2nd Cavalry enlisted at Fort Monroe and in Norfolk. How they got there, I don't know. They might have had, at some point, they probably went overland through Gates County to Suffolk, to Norfolk, um, in, in, in numbers, maybe, maybe, you know, Union troops accompanied them, or maybe they took, they took boats on the Chowan that would eventually take them to Norfolk and Fort Monroe. Very did, I, did, I answer, did I answer that? I believe so. I believe so. I think okay. they definitely, someone had put in there the Shawan Discovery Group, and we'll put it in again, the link to your organization. So for further in-depth conversation, they can donate, join, and can converse with you outside of this very compact period of time to talk about four families over the course of several decades is a lot to do, and we're appreciative. Um, another, two, I have room for two more questions. One um, says from Tonya, Taylor or Tanya Taylor, how did growing up on your family's land and knowing your family's education and influence in Winton shape or cultivate your interest in the USCT? Have you had, how have you passed that information to your family? Um, I grew up thinking this place was interesting. You know, my elders were interesting. They were good storytellers. Um, I grew up when there were only TV, there were only three TV channels and we had all this land. Also, we were lucky that we had books in the house to build a reading. Um, my daughter is part of our audience today, I'm proud to say, and my sister as well. Um, you know, just like, well, today we have a over, we had an overflow crowd. And so I promote the work. I give lectures in Hertford County. I talk to relatives about it. Um, you had a question from Michael Davenport. Michael Davenport is a cousin who grew up in Washington, but he spent plenty of time here. And so I have relatives in the audience today. In fact, even after this is over, I'm attending a Zoom party with cousins from New York City. And that grew up well. And so, uh, uh, this has allowed me to connect with a lot of people. A lot of people who are related, who are not related, who have questions, who we have so much in common. And I think connecting people is another, is an unspoken mission of Jawan Discovery. Excellent. We have one last question, and I'll hand it back over to Eric. Dr. Arnwood, Arwin Smallwood asks you to yes. see about the USCT in the Virginia community and Winton. Have you found any connections between the USCT from Indian Woods and Cuffey Town in Virginia? In Virginia or North Carolina? Well, he said Virginia, so maybe you know the geography better. Maybe it is uh, North Carolina. Well, well, in, well, well, India, well, my friend, Dr. Armin Smallwood, is from Indian Woods, which is in Bertie County. Um, and Bertie is south of my county. Bertie had 400 USCTs. 400. Hereford County only had maybe about 100, 125. But but, and, and Arwen, like me, is descended from USCTs. Uh, uh, but, but think about 400 USCTs from one county. By the way, there were 222 whites who were in unionism in Bertie. Uh, they wanted to get away from the plantation, those mean plantation owners as well, who were taking up their crops, labor, and everything. Uh, so, um, all over eastern North Carolina and eastern Virginia, you had men who were joining the Union military, whether, it was in, whether they were sailors or soldiers. 
in Coffee Town in Indian Woods. Indian Woods is next to the to the Roanoke River. That's why you had so many people from Bertie who were USCTs. And That's you had great. Grand, and also it's near Plymouth. Indian Woods is near Plymouth, where so many, so, so many, I'd say hundreds, I'd say several hundreds of men were uh, were get, gathered at Plymouth. I know in one day in 1863, you had like 33 men in Plymouth from Bertie kind of listed all at one time. Excellent. There are several questions in the Q&A that I cannot get to at this juncture, but I would definitely redirect everyone to the chat. We're going to put the email address for the Shawan Discovery Group, and I know Marvin is the most salient public historian that I know. He will get back with you directly, if not indirectly. I'm going to turn it over to Eric White to bring our closing remarks and thank all of the attendees for taking the time. And those of you with the questions, please do visit the chat. I'm going to put the Shawan Discovery Group text uh, website in there for further conversation. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Marvin, for that wonderful presentation. Um, it's uh, really significant that your mother and your family held on to so many records, I'm sure, that helped get you started on this journey. Oh, definitely. And, and my wife, uh, Linda usually reminds us, be careful what you throw away. And, um, you know, as we go through our family positions and move on, we, we really have to look at, you know, what we have uh, to tell these stories. And uh, Marvin, we're going to have to get you back uh, to talk about uh, the, uh, the Sears schools, um, you know, the, uh, the schools that were set up, the Rosewall schools. Rosewall. Yeah, the Rosewall schools and uh, at another time. And um, so this has been great. Um, this recession was recorded. We're going to be looking to see how we can make it available to people. Uh, I did want to close. Can I, can I, by, yes, go ahead. Go ahead, Marvin. Yeah, I was looking at the chats and one, uh, one person reached out about Edwin Sears having uh, his daughter being a teacher, um, Albina Hall. Well, that was my third grade teacher. Hmm. Well, all right. <laughs> uh, a lot of comments. I can't catch them all, but but I at least want to address that 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 I'm the student of a daughter of a USCT. <laughs> I'm sure your teachers will be very proud of you, and I have to uh, give you your your commute kudos and congratulations on keeping your community connected by um, um, having these markers put up in different areas that you've uh, you know done research in and bringing people together because um, you know these are stories that probably a, a number of families around you did not know much about until you started to bring some of these things to light and that's uh, very important and I'm glad that you're passionate about you know what you do and what Shawanda is doing and, and keep up the good work. Um, I want to just share my screen one more time because we want to invite people to join us for our next presentation next month, which is going to be on December the 20th. And um, with Dr. Sekou Franklin, and we will send out a link for everyone to uh, register for this presentation, uh, which I think is going to be very timely uh, in light of what's going on in the country right now and in Georgia. And um, so look forward to that. And be sure to reach out to Marvin. And we want to thank you very much for your participation today on today's program. Thank, thank you, you again. Thank you, um, Marvin, and thank you, Demeter, and thank you, Dr. Jones, and thank you, Lavanda, for being a part of this panel. Good night. Good night. <laughs>